Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, may the strength and peace of our Lord Jesus, which transcends all understanding, guard and keep you now and always. Amen. Please join me for prayer. Lord Jesus, we give thanks to you for each day that you bless us with, for opportunities to serve you and to praise your holy name. We ask, O Lord, for your guidance and direction, that our lives may may truly be pleasing in your sight. Lord, forgive us for those times when our lives stray from you, but always help us remember that it is not about us, but it is about you living through us, serving you, obeying you, praising and thanking you. So in all things, Lord, let us come before you with this attitude of humility. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What do you want? People ask that question all the time. If you go into a restaurant, if you go into Denny's, they ask you, what do you want? What do you want, though? What do you want if someone were to ask you that? When you think, does your mind immediately go to your immediate circumstances? Or do they go to broader circumstances? Do you think about yourself? Or do you think about your family, your children, your grandchildren? What do you want? Some of you, you, you might have a different answer than someone else. Some of you might say, I want to see the Broncos lose today. Some of you might want to say, I want to see the Broncos win today, or vice versa. Some of you, more importantly, will say, I want to wake up tomorrow without the pain in my bones that I felt today. I want to wake up tomorrow with more energy than I have today. Some of you, you might wake up or you might think about what you want and say, I want peace. Not just world peace, but peace in my family. Peace among my siblings, among my children. Peace with, with those I love. Well, some of you, you might say, I want financial security. I want job security. I want to stop worrying about paycheck to paycheck life. Some of you, you might want someone to listen. Someone to let you know that they care. That your life is not by itself alone. No matter how we answer that question, we know that it'll be different for each of us. We all have certain things that are in common, but all of us, when we think about it, we have different things that we want. Now, what if we turn that on its head instead of asking what we want? We ask, what does God want? That's exactly what Micah does in our text today. Micah sets up this scene. He sets up this scene between God and between his people, a covenant discussion. And he asks that question, what does God want? Lord, do you want of uh, your people to to sacrifice? Do you want of your people to be faithful? What do you want of your people? Now, we might not ask about sacrifices, but how many of us have found ourselves asking that question in our lives, the way that we live our lives? We found ourselves thinking, Lord, you have done all this for me. What do you desire? Have you ever wondered that, what the Lord desires of your life? How the Lord desires that you live each day? What his plan is for you? Micah encourages us to ask that, and maybe our first response will be, well, nothing, right? God's done it all already. In fact, if you think about the first article of the Apostles' Creed, and when we confess, we confess that by God's fatherly divine goodness and mercy of no worth of my own, he has done all this. He's given us life, air to breathe. He's given us uh, our spirit and our faith. And if you think about 1 Corinthians It does not say to boast in yourself, but boast in the Lord. And even more so, Paul says in Romans chapter 3, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. Freely. So maybe our first thought is that God wants nothing of us. God doesn't want anything. He's done it all, right? And that is true to a degree. It is true to say that God has done everything. God has done everything for our salvation. He has paid the entire price. He has sent his son Jesus, and his blood was the all-availing sacrifice. It was everything, once and for all, forever. But that's not exactly what Micah gets at today, is it? Micah's not talking about becoming God's people. He's talking about what it means to be God's people. When he asks about this, he's not asking, well, how do we become part of your covenant promise? But as your covenant promise, how should we live? Now, God, he lays out this whole thing. And if you go back to Micah 6 and I encourage you to turn in your bulletin, you'll notice that second paragraph there. After he sets up the the dialogue, we have all these things that God did for the people, starting with redeeming them from their slavery in Israel and carrying them through the present day. And so Micah asks, well, what do you want? The Lord demands faithfulness. And the people of God were anything but faithful. 
In fact, the people of God, when, they, when you hear Micah ask that question, it's hard to believe that the rest of the people were asking that same question. Or at least if they were, they weren't asking it the same tone they, that Micah was. Because as Micah asked the question, he genuinely wanted to know what God wanted. But then you look at the people of God, and their faithfulness to God had turned into idolatry. Their love for one another had been exchanged for greed, for self-desires and self-interest. God's desire for justice had been turned into pride, self-centeredness. And so if the people of God asked that question of him, what do you want? It probably didn't come out that way. It probably came out more like the waitress who's come to your table for the third time that day to fill up your water glass again, and she says, now what do you want? Or maybe their question came out more like, what do you want? And we kind of chuckle at that a little bit, but how often do we share that same sinful attitude? How often do we come to the Lord and we know what he's done for us? We can imagine and think about the sacrifice and we picture it in our minds and we still say, what do you want now, Lord? We say these things and we have this attitude because we live this life that, that we struggle to see how God is constantly working. We come against these difficult times in our day-to-day -day lives. We come against these trials and what more do you want of me, Lord? What more can you ask of me? How much more can I give? And we find ourselves forgetting that second part that as we continue in the creed, the very next clause where it says, for all this, we are to love and praise, serve and obey our Lord. Luther makes it sound in the creed as though it's a privilege, as though it's an opportunity, a blessing to serve our Lord, to obey him, to do what he commands, to be faithful. But so often that's not the case with us, is it? So often, like the people in Micah's day, we find ourselves as looking at our lives as though they're too hard. That if God wants one more thing of me, how can I carry it out? We think about our lives and we think about everything that's going on and we say, how do I have time to praise the Lord? Maybe I'll praise Him as I'm going out the door this morning on the way to the car, on the way to work. Maybe I'll serve him when I get a chance, but Lord, could you give me a pass on this one because I might not get to it. And we find ourselves with this attitude, a sinful attitude. Sometimes it's because we don't want to look like the rest of the world or we want to look like the rest of the world. We don't want to look unpopular. We don't want to seem different. But isn't that exactly when we ask that question, what do you want, Lord? What we're asking Lord, what do you want as contrary to the way this world lives as the way to this world works? Easier said than done, though. Easier to fall into that attitude. Easier to resent than to really want to know the Lord's desire for our lives. And this is why we need to daily go back to the cross. This is why we need to daily revisit Jesus' death and resurrection for us. Because while it is foolishness to those who are not believing, we do know it is the power of God. It is the power of God, Jesus Christ, coming to each one of us to provide us salvation, to the power of God, to provide us forgiveness, and not in some general way. So often we go to that story of the cross and we look at it and we say, well, that is a nice story, that is a beautiful story, but that story is not just a nice and beautiful story. It's your story of salvation. It's the story of God for each one of you, for your sinful lives, for the way that you've lived and broken God's law. It is God's coming to you, and it is His power of forgiveness for your sins for my sins, for our sins. That is truly the power of God on the cross. It's the power that he has to change our lives, to change our lives that we might follow him and obey him and serve him so that we might live lives as his people. Now Micah, he gives us a simple answer to this. If you go to the end of Micah chapter 6, our, our epistle for today, it's not the end of Micah 6, but the end of our, our Old Testament rather for today, you'll notice he gives us three simple phrases of how we're supposed to live our lives. He doesn't give us some vague definition, but very specific way. First of all, we're to do justice. We're to love kindness or mercy, depending on your translation. And we're to walk humbly with God. Now, while this is a simple command, it's much harder to carry it out, isn't it? Let's start with that humble walk with God. 
It's easy to be humbled and walking with God in humility when we think about the cross. But so often, even among Christians, it's hard to find true humility, isn't it? It's hard to find true humility because so often we look at the cross, and even as we look at the cross, we do so with sinful pride. We look at the cross and we dismiss the gift and we just think about it as, well, that was nice and almost a level of expectation. But true humility means looking at our lives, realizing that we are poor, miserable sinners. Looking at our lives and realizing how unworthy we are. Except for the fact that on the cross, Jesus made us worthy. Except for on the cross, Jesus did not measure who we were, who we should be, who the world expects us to be but he made us worthy by his blood. And that's significant, folks, because when we look at our lives that way, we realize that it is not about what we do and what we've accomplished. Oh, those are certainly gifts from God, things that we should use those gifts faithfully. But ultimately, our worth is not found in ourselves, but our worth is found in whose we are as Jesus Christ's children. And that leads us to look at something even more important. And that's that beautiful gift of justice, that divine justice that God showed. You know, God, he, he didn't just ignore our sins and pretend they weren't there. He didn't just sweep them under the rug and say, oh, well, that's okay. That's not how he dealt with our sin, is it? Instead, he took our sin, confronted it head on, and sent his own son, Jesus Christ. That is true justice, not pretending and treating one person one way and another person another, but treating us all justly. He treated us justly in the sense that that all of us were predestined for salvation. Paul tells us that in Ephesians chapter 1. There are those who will reject, those who turn their back on God. But that gift of salvation was for all people. And that justice is meant to be lived out in the world. That justice is meant to be carried out by God's people. But so often in our world today, we don't see it being carried out, do we? We don't see true justice. We celebrate the fact that America is a just nation. And yet, this very weekend, there will be hundreds of thousands of young girls and young women who are being sold in the sex trade. Where is their justice? On a daily basis, thousands of children are put to death and murdered in abortion clinics. Where is their voice? Where is their justice? We live in a nation where we celebrate justice and and yet we see all around us this injustice. We see all around us these ways that the, the world is unjust and we don't respond. God called us to do justice, but where are we? And not just our church, but the church, big C, the entire church. Where are we? Where are we in the face of of this prostitution, this sex sexual slavery? Where are we in, this, in, the, in the murder of children? We're safely behind the doors. Think about the ways that God wants us to do justice. To do justice among His people so that they might see His true love. And that's a, one of the most beautiful words that Micah uses here. The word hesed, it's... And, and in my opinion, it's one of the most beautiful words in the Hebrew language. But the word hesed, it's, it, it's more than just mercy. It's more than just loving kindness. It's, it's this deep love that is beyond our measure. When we talk about hesed, when we talk about that, when Micah talks about us showing that love, we first reflect on the fact that God showed us that love, that self-sacrificial love, that gift of his own self for us. Maybe you've heard the word in Greek, agape, that's very similar to it. It's not a word that is empty like our love word for love in English. It's a word that means so much more. It's a word that is not about our desires. It's not about what makes us comfortable. It's not about what makes us popular. But that love, that agape love, that hesed love, true love that Jesus showed us on, cro- on the cross, that true love is that deep desire to show others God's love for them. That true love is that deep desire to put ourselves out there in ways that maybe we wouldn't otherwise, so that other people might too know how much God loves them, that he was willing to give his own life for them. Michael, he gives us a simple command, doesn't he? To do justice, to love kindness, to love mercy, to, to walk humbly with our God. 
So simple, but so hard to carry out. And that's why we so often, we need always the power of the Holy Spirit. Because on our own, we cannot walk that path. On our own, we cannot live that life. On our own, we cannot even imagine doing those things which God desires of us. But it's the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. It's the work of the Holy Spirit leading us each day to to come to the cross again and see that mercy new, uh, new each morning. To see that love that God showed us and to break down those sinful desires we have. Instead, open our eyes to the hurt and pain of our world. To the world that needs our Savior. So that they will not simply hear the words of the cross as foolishness. But they will hear those words of the cross as the power of God through Christ Jesus to save us. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, we give thanks to you for giving us prophets like Micah. Prophets who show us your way, who show us your desires, and show us your delights. Lord, we thank you that you have sent your Son to be our all-availing sacrifice, that he has paid the entire price for us. Lord, help us live lives then that reflect his love, that reflect his mercy and his justice. And Lord, lead us to humbly walk with you each day. We know, Lord, that this is difficult and that on our own we will slip and we will fail time and again. Lift us up by your Holy Spirit that we might continue in those ways, faithfully carrying out your will. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.